since 2009, she's worked with UNDP and is currently a knowledge management and communication specialist, and she's involved in climate change adaptation and biodiversity projects. Uh, next, we have my longtime friend and mentor, Brian Hallweil, who is also a Free Tank board member and an inspiration to me every day. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of Edible Manhattan, Brooklyn, Long Island, East End, and an expert on all things food. And I'm uh, really excited to talk to him about the intersection of food and technology. Uh, I'm also excited to introduce Sean Lenahan, the founder of uh, The Honest Bison, which was created in 2012 to produce healthier, sustainable, humanely treated, and minimally processed bison meat. And last but not least, Viraj Puri, the co-founder and CEO of Gotham Greens. He's an author and has developed and managed startups around the globe focused on sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, and environmental design. I did not forget you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pleased to produce, uh, introduce Teresa Juan Fuchs, a uh, coffee expert and the sales and marketing director of the Genuine Origin Coffee Project. The project is an initiative at Bowl Cafe to create a more efficient supply chain for smallholder producers. So I'm excited to have them all here today. I'm just going to jump in, um, I think, with, with Andrea. And, so when, when I think of the future of food, I think about climate change. And I know that's something that you're working on every day. Um, I'm interested to hear a couple of things. One, how, how you think technology can play a role in helping both farmers and eaters mitigate and adapt to climate change. And also how you communicate the urgency of this issue in a way that doesn't scare people, but really makes it, you know, we, we have to do something now if we're going to change things. Um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things that we could cover with those questions, but I think um, technology has a really important role to play, whether it's really simple things like rainwater catchment tanks, like ways to collect water and improve water access, or whether it's um, cell phones. Um, cell phone saturation in sub-Saharan Africa was 10% 20 years ago, and now it's 84%. And the way that that technology can revolutionize farmers' lives by simple text messages about when to plant, it's amazing. And they've leapfrogged that technology. You know, they've leapfrogged from having no phones to having smartphones. And so that's really incredibly powerful, especially in a changing climate when rainfall is changing and um, uh, drought. You're, you're experiencing so many things that are uh, changing the way that you need to plant that farmers aren't able to keep up with the changes. Um, and then there are other ways that technology can help, like with different uh, seed species, like uh, saltwater tolerant species in the Pacific, where they can continue to grow um, their food in the face of sea level rise. Uh, so there are a lot, of, a lot of incredible technologies, and then really simple technologies, like food preservation techniques that we take for granted in, developing, in developed countries. In developing countries, those can transform lives and especially lives for women, which 43% um, of smallholder farmers are women. And so the more we can empower women to be landowners and um, yeah, diversify their income, uh, the faster we'll transform in the, in the face of a changing climate. Absolutely, and, and that's you know investment that can come from, from countries, it can come from NGOs, it can come from the United Nations organizations. I, I'm interested in hearing from you, one thing that I've uh, been thinking about a lot is, you know, often we, we as people in the global north think we have a lot to teach people in the developing world. And I think with climate change, we, it's actually the other way around because these are communities and uh, countries that have been dealing with these issues for, or at least recognize them far longer than we have. Can you talk about what, you know, Midwestern farmers or California farmers can learn from some of the, the farmers uh, in, in the global south and how they're dealing with climate change? Yeah, I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of different ways that we can learn um, and have a lot of humility for what we're doing and how we're changing our ecosystems. In some of the more dramatic landscapes that UNDP works, and we work in 170 countries and territories, in some of the more dramatic landscapes like Tuvalu, where the highest point of land is three meters above the sea, they're coming up with really innovative, simple ways um, they have these floating beds um, where they're growing food and they're, uh, yeah, I think some of uh, 
the simpler interventions hold a lot of potential. And so when we think that um, technology in the sense of um, expensive, uh, large-scale farming techniques, that's not where the true transformative potential occurs. And I think that a lot of things that local uh, communities in developing countries do really well is they are local, they are organic, they are sustainable. They're all these things that we aspire to be in the north, and um, they do that as a matter of uh, efficiency, or not even efficiency, it's an, an imperative. Right. You know, they, there's no other choice for them but to be local. Um, so, yeah. No, and I think that, you know, if we get anything out of this panel today, it's that silver bullet technologies are not the answer. I think we can all agree on that, but there are lots of local solutions that are really working a lot better. So, Sean, I, I want to bring you into this conversation. So, you know, one, I'm interested in why bison. I, I, I have suspicions of, of what it might be. But to build on this climate change theme, how, and, and the communication theme as well, how, how is the work you're doing uh, helping you know the world adapt to climate change, and how do you communicate that that to the people you're selling to? Sure. So I'll start with the supply side and, and what we're doing in our method of raising the bison. So we're 100% grass-fed, um, which is a pasture-based solution where we don't confine the animals or feed them uh, corn, soy, wheat uh, to increase the weight. We use their natural and uh, appropriate diet of grass. Um, and so we practice a method commonly known as holistic management, pioneered by Alan Savory and, and ranchers who have uh, measured how to use pastures to, to create a great, a great um, carcass. Um, so we use uh, time and the um, moisture levels um, by taking the herding animal, in our case it's bison, to graze all the pastures for a certain amount of time. What that does is the, um, what's the word, a uh, symbiotic relationship between the animal and the soil, where the farmer really is a grass farmer, as opposed to a rancher taking care of animals, <laughs> they're grass farmers. And so um, the monetization occurs with the animal. The ecosystem that gets regenerated is as the animal eats the grass, um, they aerate, defecate, urinate, and really get all of the ecosystem. So all the trillions of bacteria and microbes that are in the soil, uh, the dung beetles that are working in there, the uh, insects, the birds. So all of those things working together produce more grass, mm -hmm. which makes a, a better carcass, right? So we have a healthy animal. So that um, results in deeper roots, uh, which can, um, what it turns into a sponge. So, so the water cycle then, um, your pastures can hold water for years, as opposed to an extractive method to where you're tilling uh, or have a monocrop, those roots don't exist. And so the uh, nutrients in the soil disappear. So, um, we're using all the natural inputs and the cycles of life um, to work for the carcass. The carbon cycle follows the same as the water cycle. It takes a little longer, but that's where you hear about 100% grass-fed, trapping carbon, it's just pulling it back down through those, those little solar panels, those grass. Absolutely. On, the, on the consumer side, how do we communicate that? We, we show them a sexy picture of a steak. <laughs> <laughs> I want that in my belly. That's, that's where we lead with. It's a little tougher to um, make that leap to the consumer of, yes, you're trapping carbon. Yes, you're mi helping mitigate droughts. You're electing for a regenerative as opposed to an extractive agriculture system. So we start with sexy steak. That's great. And I think that's such an important thing to bring up. You know, we talk about climate change, but we forget that foods, you know, it's supposed to be tasty and, and be delicious. And that's, you know, such a good point. You and I were talking earlier about how you use technology and, and some really interested, interesting data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think this is such a great combination of something I want to get in, uh, to later with Brian about combining high and low tech solutions. Sure. So we're excited to work with PastureMap, which is a grazing management software that uses uh, Google Earth 
it measures um, the time and the density, their stocking density of the animals on the pasture to then get the resolution down to the animal, the ear tag, of where that animal was born, which pastures it went to, measure the moisture content of that year or season, uh, all the way up to how did it perform. Um, so it's very much um, collecting the big data of what we know in other industries like uh, wine and chocolate and coffee, uh, but this terroir, what did this land produce? Um, and so with Pasture Map, we're going then to be able to track and be able to say, well, this grass-fed bison in Wisconsin had this terroir or data behind it. So right now it's helping the, the ranchers manage the time uh, on the pasture, but ultimately we want to be able to share that with the consumer of, here's exactly where your state came from, and here's why it was great. That's really great. So that's one of the technologies. What a cool way to develop a flavor profile. I just, I love that. So, so Ryan, you and I have been talking for as long as we've known each other about uh, innovations in agriculture. And so this idea, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with it, is the combination of high and low tech, whether it's cell phones or other things. Can you give a few examples of things that you've seen that you really like or think that are cool or have potential? Uh, so I think what's important to note is that the conversation has really evolved in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, I would say when uh, Danielle and I were at the World Watch Institute writing about global and local food trends, uh, we were sort of across the board uh, opposed to technology. Uh, we saw primarily genetically modified crops and biotechnology as the technology everyone was excited about. And when we asked the question, is this helping us farm better and is this helping us eat better, we didn't see a lot of evidence. So what has changed in the last 20 years is that technology has become an indispensable part of our lives for better or for worse, right? I mean, we're, we're all using emojis, we're all dependent on our smartphones, and smart connected devices are moving into every single aspect of our lives, and that's also becoming true of the food system. Uh, what I think has also happened in the last 20 years is the good food movement has failed to scale in a lot of ways. We've seen explosive growth in farmers markets and CSAs and sort of, you know, improvements on the margin, but not really large systematic change. So uh, from my perspective, we have to be more uh, open to how technology can move into the food system and again help us farm better and help us eat better. Uh, and I see a lot of the most positive examples sort of moving in the same direction as, as you guys are mentioning, and that is we're leaving a lot of money on the table when it comes to food. We're still dependent on just a handful of crops for feeding the planet. We're, we've basically ignored tens of thousands of crops and most of the food biodiversity in the world, and we're ignoring different places where we can grow food. So the notion of growing food on rooftops and growing food on, you know, in abandoned urban areas and growing food on our counters and making it easier to garden, and all of these are interesting technology innovations which begin to shift us away from largely an industrial and monocultural food system and make it easier to get more diversity into the system. And I think what you see with you know, people eating bison as opposed to beef or making milk out of oats as opposed to just dairy or just almonds is the consumer supporting food biodiversity. That's flowing up and down throughout the entire food chain and it's making the entire system more resilient. Uh, the other innovation that I'm pretty excited about um, is sort of the miniaturization of agriculture. So the trend has always been towards bigger farms, bigger machines, uh, and, and sort of fewer farmers. And now some of the really cool stuff that we're seeing uh, is tools to make small farms much more viable. And that's analytics that allow farms you know, to have sort of the capability that a Nest thermostat gives you in your house where if you want to reduce pesticide use, if you want to reduce energy use, if you want to reduce water use, it's that much easier to get these sorts of alerts in your farm. And you're even seeing sort of smart, small farm machinery, smart farm robots that are showing up on farms and are not to support the giant farm, but are uh, small so that they can attack those niches that farmers have been, have, have been ignoring. So I think of a technology called Robot, which has been developed in the Midwest. It's sort of a lawnmower sized, uh, um, self-directed, self-contained robot, and um, it goes between the rows of corn and rows of soybeans. It mulches weeds as opposed to spraying herbicides, and after it mulches the weeds, 
It can plant cover crop. So this is something that a large tractor simply can't do, and most farmers can't do, but this small robot can do that. It saves a lot of herb, it eliminates herbicide use in these farms, plants the cover crop, and is a great assistant for the farmer. So there's, there's all sorts of technologies and innovations like that, and if we, again, hold it to the standard, is it helping us farm better? Is it helping us eat better? I think we're gonna quickly divide the technologies that are distracting us from the ones that are important to look at. That's such a great point. And I think, you know, talking about our personal evolution as we've seen agriculture evolve and technology evolve, it's, you know, great to say, okay, I've changed my mind. I, I feel differently about some of these technologies than I did you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and, and one more thing is that the innovation that Sean's talking about of sort of managing the grass and that supporting the animal, I mean, that's super sophisticated ecological science. So that's a form of technology and a form of innovation. So we're not just talking about, you know, breeding tech or robots or smart devices. We're talking about also leaning much more on ecological knowledge than we have before. Absolutely, and that's something I learned from Brian years ago, this idea of going forward by going back and looking at some of these traditional and indigenous practices and really you know, combining them with other things. I think it's a really excellent point. Um, Viraj, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm going to cut in. Yeah, point. absolutely. Oh, I don't know if this is on. Oh, it is on. Great. Um, sorry to cut in, but I was no. thinking about two pieces, about communication, but also about scale. Um, and this idea about local knowledge is that one of the things that is difficult to scale is the real local knowledge. Like, farmers aren't waiting for people in like a boardroom or a think tank to like tell them what to do about climate change, right? They're adapting all the time. But how do you spread that knowledge more widely, which also relates to scale? Like, how do you scale different movements up? And I think coffee is, you know, a small example, but coffee, 90% of your coffee is grown by smallholder farmers. And that's always going to be the case because there's not a lot more access to land and there's certainly not enough capital to increase your land holdings as a farmer, a coffee farmer. Um, but just using cell phone technology has allowed farmers in Kenya and farmers in Honduras to share information for one of the first times ever. And, and talking about technology, not just that our minds have changed, but I think the approach to tech has changed. Because mm -hmm. more people have realized that it's not going away and it's in your pocket in a way that could be more useful to everybody. So, you know, farmers that traditionally didn't have any access to agricultural, you know, innovations or, or data now are doing their own farm mapping. And institutions can definitely help scale that. Like, I work for one of the largest, largest commodities trading firms in the world is normally not the place you would look for for sustainable innovation, but that is exactly what we're doing because there is a piece about communication that's important and that fear motivates people, right? If you're not gonna get to drink coffee in 10 years, right, you're gonna suddenly pay attention. I literally just heard a murmur in the room. Um, and that no, is no. <laughs> But that's important to think about. And it motivates the bigger industries to start looking for smaller solutions that are scalable. I just wanted to throw that in. No, that's, Thanks for letting me that in. No, that's a great point. I, I'd like to build on what you said before. So farmers are sharing information for the first time when they couldn't before, but they're also getting information about markets and prices. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that can make farmers more competitive, get higher prices for things when they know more about, you know, they totally. have the access to that info now? We were just talking a little bit about commodities in general, right, with the way commodities markets work, but I'm gonna answer a slightly different question than the one you asked, because I think access to pricing data is really important when we talk about crops, right, and the, the livelihoods of farmers, but it's so much more than just what you get paid for your product, because you have to look at a whole business solution. And this is, again, when we talk about technology, one of the things Vol Cafe, it's the large commodities trading firm, uh, uh, has done is actually start to standardize baseline data for farmers, not just around market pricing, but around what's your cost of production. And I guess this sounds like a fancy term, but it's pretty basic, like what does it cost you to run your business? And this is data that has never been done in the coffee industry. Never been done. I mean, so we want to have all these conversations about we need to pay more for coffee, we need to certify this, we need to do that. Why don't we first start to figure out how much does it cost to grow and produce coffee? And then we can start to make those decisions. And that was actually the whole founding principle of the program that we built called Full Cafe Way is what is your cost of production, both environmentally, so how can you have land for the next 50 years, how can you have access to water for the next 50 years, but also how can you afford labor, and if you need inputs, and if you need seeds, and if you need nurseries, and all of those things, right, and then build from there. So access to market data is important, but access to basic business knowledge is almost more transformative. When we look at 
farms. Very empowering, I imagine, for, for the farmers you work with and a farmer rancher like Sean to have that information and have it be accessible. In and for pocket. Exactly. And, and for the women that UNDP is working with, you mentioned earlier that you know women make up 43% at least of the agricultural labor force. It's likely in some countries a lot more. So women having access to this information is also very empowering. Do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that we found really transformative, um, just another example of a really simple technology, is a multifunctional platform where they can grind seeds. And so it'll save, you know, six hours a week or ten hours a week for them that they can grind their seeds. And we did this in Mali and Niger um, with two projects. Um, and what we found were uh, women were running for office. So then now they're in leadership roles within their community. Not only are they earning money, and able to invest that how they want, they're also able to devote the time that would otherwise have been spent, you know, just grinding seeds, um, running for office. So, I mean, again, it's, it's even more simple than what you're talking about, you know, it doesn't, it's not even a cost-benefit analysis. It's, are you, if you're a young girl in Niger, are you traveling six hours a week to um, collect water, or are you in school now that you have a rainwater tank in your village? So, yeah. Incredibly transformative. Viraj, I, I'd like to bring you into this conversation. And um, Brian was talking earlier about how sort of things have changed in agriculture and our viewpoints. And so, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, people were not thinking as much about urban food production as they are now. Even though people were doing it in cities all over the world um, because they had to, and because they, they continued to need to grow food in cities. Um, I think one billion people worldwide, that's a rough estimate from the United Nations, are growing food in cities. I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of how technology can transform urban agriculture and, and how it can help you know, make cities in, into centers of food production in ways that people couldn't think about before. <clears throat> so yeah, about the one billion people in the world who, who are fed really through urban farming, most of those are actually in the global south where it's more subsistence agriculture, um, backyard plots, things of that nature, and then in, in sort of more in the developing world, the community gardens that we've had, urban farms we've had, have certainly played a role in meeting people's food needs, but they've largely been more community-driven um, endeavors that are more about uh, pedagogy or they're about sort of bringing the community together in, in sort of urban environments. and. Um, the sort of movement that I believe you're alluding to is sort of this transition to more commercial scale urban farming. The idea that you can actually grow at, at, at significant scale to produce a meaningful amount of food to actually displace the, um, the alternative, which is sort of being imported um, into, into urban areas. So you also touched upon sort of, you know, there's no panacea, there's no silver bullet, right? So I don't, I think it's unrealistic to imagine a future where we are producing the lion's share of our food needs in cities, you know, things like protein, uh, grains, um, tropical fruits, things like coffee, you know, it's not quite realistic. However, technology does enable us to grow certain food crops, um, especially highly perishable food crops, things like salad greens, tomatoes, herbs, uh, which are things that have to travel great distances to reach urban consumers, especially here in New York. Um, and being so perishable, they don't have a very long shelf life. So think about, think about a head of lettuce, about 98% of the lettuce in, in this country is grown in California and Arizona, and then it has to sort of get harvested, put on a truck, ship across the country, and by the time it reaches consumers here in New York, it's already a week or 10 days old, only leaving a few days of shelf life, which just results in a lack of nutrition, flavor, taste, and then also contributes to sort of food waste. So the concept that we had when we launched our business was, why not grow that food in greater proximity to, um, to the actual consumer? And we rely on greenhouse technology, which has existed for a long time, controlled environment agriculture, which as the name implies, allows you to control the environment to um, grow consistently and reliably year round. Um, modern greenhouse agriculture, though, typically has been very resource intensive in terms of water use, in terms of use of chemical inputs, and in terms of energy use. So uh, our, our concept sort of um, tries to address some of those issues. So uh, recycling irrigation water, not using um, chemical pesticides, recirculating all sorts of um, synthetic nutrients, things of that nature. And I think what we've demonstrated, us and our peers, is, is that uh, urban agriculture can be practiced on a commercial scale. But I think it's really important to also note that, and now we've expanded to Chicago, and now we're looking at other cities as well. And I don't think we have any sort of hubris that we're sort of gonna 
by ourselves revolutionize the food system where this is necessarily going to be the future of farming. But I think it's one way to participate in a much more robust sort of regional and local food shed that, you know, things like salad greens don't have to be flown in from around the world or fresh basil doesn't have to be flown in from Israel, which is frankly, when we started our business, that's where a lot of the basil that we would eat in New York City, that's where it was coming from. So really, really remarkable. Um, uh, just the kind of the food miles there, yeah. So I, I'm interested in hearing from you how you think sort of, you know, the, the things that you're doing are applicable in other settings. You know, we've talked a little bit about the developing world. What can farmers, you know, take, what lessons have you learned that they can take to their own sort of environments? So my inspiration for actually greenhouses actually came from the so-called Global South. I was, I was living in a remote area of the Indian Himalayas on the uh, western edge of the Tibetan Plateau, a place called Ladakh. Um, and it's essentially a high altitude desert, about 12,000 feet and up. And it's a, it's, it's a rain shadow, so it's really a high altitude desert. So other than snow melt, there's no precipitation. There's about 340 sunny days a year. But there's been a thriving um, Tibetan Buddhist population that's lived there for thousands of years. I and mean, these people really know how to work with the land and their resources. So being such a sunny place, they've been using um, uh, sort of drip irrigation techniques for centuries, right? They've been um, using passive solar building design for centuries. So they're building their homes and dwellings with really, really thick walls that gain solar gain during the day and then those walls release heat out into, the build, uh, out into their homes at night, really acting as a, as a heat sink. Those are all fundamental principles to green building technology today. And uh, when I was living in this community, they, they were also using greenhouses, very primitive greenhouses that essentially were just thin plastic sheeting. And it was extending the growing season basically all year round. And again, they would have these lean-tos where the north wall would use really thick walls collecting solar gain and essentially acting as a heater. And then they would have drip irrigation from these essentially snow melt. And what they would also do is, which is fascinating, they would take this snow melt and they would actually spray, they would build these large icebergs, almost these ice boulders, um, and they would spray water on them every day in the winter, every day in the winter. And what would happen is, is that that would become an irrigation source through the summer. So all the snow would have melted on all the mountains. However, these ice boulders would stay and sort of drip irrigate um, um, these, uh, these greenhouses and these apple orchards and plum orchards. And so um, point being is, is that personally, I was inspired to get into agriculture from, from learning more from the global south and have really approached food not from a food, you know, I don't come from a farming background, I don't come from a food background, but it's just, it's just a staggering amount of natural resources that go into agriculture. It's the largest consumer of land on the planet, it's the largest consumer of fresh water, it's the leading source of global water pollution and is responsible for about 20% of global carbon emissions. So. We, if we're serious about climate change, we have to be serious about food. Absolutely, that's such a great point. Um, and and I, before we get into the questions from the audience, I want you to each take a few minutes or a minute or so and, and talk about what your prediction is for you know 2030. What, where do you see the food system? Will women have you know more um, prominence than they have now, Andrea? Well, I, um, it's funny that you mentioned 2030. It, I don't know how many people are aware of the Sustainable Development Goals or the agenda for 2030. So there are 17 goals that 193 countries came together in 2015 and agreed that we could achieve. And one of those, um, SDG 2, is zero hunger. So that's hoping that by 2030 we will have no hunger, which I think, you know, it's 2017. Right now we have 800 million people that are suffering from chronic malnutrition, 100 million children under the age of five. I see a girlfriend crying in the front row, which makes me very emotional. Um, 100 million kids under the age of five that are um, chronically malnourished, which means they are stunted. Um, that's a problem. In four countries, we have 20 million people facing famine right now. It's 2017, that shouldn't be happening. Um, and I'm really happy that I work for an organization that believes by 2030 we can achieve zero hunger. So I think we all have a role to play in that, um, but it is achievable. We have enough food on this planet to feed everyone. It's a lot, um, and again, one of the pillars, one of the three pillars that we do is democratic governance and peace building. And sometimes we forget when we talk about food that the distribution of food relies on that that a country, um, there's been no 
a democracy that has faced a famine. So I think that you know part of this solution to achieving zero hunger by 2030 relies on that pillar, which is democratic governance and peace building. So, yeah. Great answer, great answer. Teresa, do you wanna go next? Well, I said, it's funny that, not funny, but uh, hunger was one of the things we talked a lot about. Um, there's been tons of data. So coffee farmers, to me it is crazy that farmers are going hungry, right? that is what they do, right? But something like 70% of coffee farmers face food insecurity. Um, three to eight months out of the year, like, which is, is crazy again if you think about, I mean, this is what they do, they grow things, but they can't grow food to eat. Uh, there's even like colloquial names in every country for it called like the lean season or the thin months. Um, so I guess the only solution that I really see for hunger and climate change and all these things is empowering the local knowledge that already exists. Like people innovate all the time, and how do we, how do we help them share that knowledge through broader communities. And I think coffee is a great example of this, not just in coffee drinking communities, which is very passionate, widespread, connected, but also in coffee growing communities, there's the same kind of passion. Um, and so you have to look at things like doing really good data analysis of your farm, looking at your productivity, looking at these things to make sure that you are also growing enough food to feed yourself. And, or that, and that your community is working collectively on these kinds of things. But I, I don't have an answer other than, other than we have to be more humble and honest with ourselves about where the solutions will come from. Do you think we're on the right track? I think that I have been excited, I mean, I, I was excited to, to join this program, right, at, at Vol Cafe because that's what it's focusing on, right? It's focusing on farmer prosperity. If we don't talk about sustainability, that is not enough, right? Farmers need to thrive in order to exist and the things that we get from farms to exist, right? So I guess there's, there's hope out there and there's people doing great work, but I think that it's a very complicated political solution and it's multi-part, so I'm not sure, yeah, how that's gonna work. My fingers are crossed. I feel like you gotta do good work, that's all you can do. Absolutely, absolutely. Brian, so are, are we gonna have local and regional food in the future or are we, is that done? No, it's not done at all. I think it's still continuing to grow. It's just it was failing to scale up. And a lot of these innovations in how we think about food culture and how we move food around and how we make it easier to make a living as a small, diverse farmer will help that continue to grow. What I think, what I'm hoping and think we're on path to achieve by 2030 is we are going to have a more diverse food system. The pendulum swung so far in the direction of a non-diverse food system and you see across the hall um, in the products that we're eating that you know there's a burger over there that looks and tastes like a burger but is made out of peas and there's oat milk and um, all sorts of products that did not exist on most of our tables and are using more biodiversity. So I see that happening and having all sorts of wonderful benefits. The other thing I hope is going to happen is that the notion of food deserts and lean months, uh, because we can identify them more, that those will become more intolerable uh, because we are figuring out how to get foods into those areas. Um, one innovation that was mentioned yesterday that I'm particularly excited about is that there are all sorts of software solutions to making it easier for people to use uh, food stamps and um, other sort of food insecurity tools um, and to use them in ways that they haven't before, shopping at grocery stores, shopping at farmers markets, uh, using those food stamps to get low interest loans and rural credit and health insurance. And those are problems that the conventional, the, the, the current industry hasn't been able to hack and it took software people to figure that out. Uh, one of the largest uh, dairy cooperatives in, in India, Dodla, uh, which has about 250,000 members, uh, they have this really interesting mobile first payment innovation that allows them to pay the dairy farmers electronically as soon as they're dropping off their milk. And previously, this large established cooperative was taking months and months to pay their farmers. So the notion of allowing them to bridge those lean months to get some credit to allow them to get to the next season is becoming that much easier. And so I'm, I think our food system is going to be more diverse, it's going to be more local and regional, and the problem areas are going to be harder and harder to ignore. That's great. Sean, do you want to go next and talk about... Sure. What, yeah, what, what I see in the future, I think, I, I'm very hopeful. Um, because several trends are, are going in the right direction. And one, I think, is transparency. 
the technology to know where your food comes from, understand who you're trusting your nourishment to, um, a marketer, a distributor, a processor, a rancher, the soil. So as that transparency um, becomes more clear and it's easier for me to share, here's where, here's where your food that I provide to you comes from, I think is super critical because what that does is that gives every consumer the knowledge that cheap food is a trap and holy smokes, if my coffee farmer needs a meal, uh, yeah, here, you keep them fed. So as the market shifts and understands that you need to pay more or invest more into the highest quality, most nourishing um, food, that, that then, then they understand the true cost of, well, I'd like the environment to, to work for me as opposed to it um, against me. Those old systems of factory farming and extractive will, will uh, go be opted out of. The people stop buying it. Um, <clears throat> so to me, that transparency leading to the awareness, whether it's a health and wellness, whether it's taste, I think that the diversity is, a, is another big trend in understanding that terroir is in many, many things. Um, all are super positive trends that, that will only continue and, and help, it, help it get to where we need to go. Great, great. Mirage? Uh, just to build upon what people have said, I think one area is data science. I think just uh, being able to collect more and more data points and be able to work smarter. Um, traditionally in agriculture, productivity yields have just come from more chemical inputs and I think we need to be smarter about productivity. So at least in the controlled environment agriculture space, if we're able to collect, I mean we do, but collect millions of data points every day, things like temperature, humidity, light level, CO2, oxygen, if we can make better informed decisions, um, to increase yield, not by increasing inputs necessarily, but just by working smarter, not harder. Um, I think those productivity yields are, are, are going to be a lot more sustainable. Great, thank you all. So I'd like to open it up for questions about 10 minutes. Yeah. To, okay. Um, so I got a mic too. I'm okay, great. Around. So I'll move around too. Who has a question? Right here. For, uh, I have a question for Raj. Um, I'm in the, my family's in the produce distribution industry. We deal with bigger farms and more industrial sized farms. Um, but a big topic that's come about recently is more local or urban farming techniques. Um, one point of interest that I have with it is how do you see that line of products expanding past lettuce or just basil or tomatoes? Is the technology coming around the corner or will it be focused on the items you're already dealing with, um, or you know, will it expand to, I don't know, melons or strawberries or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So currently, as far as commercial scale, profitable, commercially viable um, food production is concerned, you are li currently limited to leaf crops and vine crops. So leaf crops are all your different lettuce varieties, salad greens, herbs, and then vine crops, things like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, um, eggplant, some squash. Technically, you can grow anything in a controlled environment. You can grow rice, you can grow an avocado tree, you can, you can do anything. But the, the question is yield and productivity and, and, and commercial viability. So there is a lot of R&D that's happening uh, beyond those crops that I mentioned. There's, there's a lot of R&D going on with strawberries. That's probably going to be the next crop that's going to be commercially grown in greenhouse facilities. But beyond that, there's still a lot of challenges um, to growing things like grains and the root vegetables or, or, or anything that's on a tree or on a bush. So it's very, it's still quite limited. Other questions? Can you pass that back? This is for Sean Lennon. If, if everybody ate the same amount of meat, meat they eat and they used all the land that you need to grow that beef, how, what, what's your thoughts about that? So, you're talking about then if, where the critique of the cattle industry or the livestock industry is that it'd be too much, can't be 10 billion people on, on that? Yeah. yeah, so that's the part that I don't think, the people that are making that argument haven't looked at how mother nature and the ecosystem works. So, or they're looking at what exists now in confined animal operation, feeding operations, where you've concentrated all those animals and putting weight on them, those, 
those don't work in the ecosystem. There's an environmental cost, there's a health cost, there's well, animal welfare. But if if we took out, let's, what if we took Nebraska and Iowa and took out half of the corn and soybeans and wheat and so forth, and then we put in grass-fed animals, we, we could feed a lot of people, and we'd remove the extractive um, technologies of pesticides and so forth, and we would get ecosystems that trap carbon and mitigate droughts and so forth. So you'd get back to, in this country, in this continent, that 150 years ago had 60 million bison running around on it, that built the fertility in the Great Plains. So if you started to remove the monocrops and put back ecosystems, I think everybody could eat uh, as much meat protein as they need. In the, so the question was, um, how, how do you, how do most people afford that, you know, meat proteins? Um, I'm not an economist on that, but what I have seen is that, um, at least in this country, how the industrial uh, farm system took over and rewarded consumers rewarded the the factory farm for cheap food, but not necessarily nutritious food. So it didn't put the ecosystem. So I think. The more capital and, and innovation from entrepreneurs, but, but science, and then understanding how the ecosystem works, um, can then produce more proteins that is appropriately scaled. So for instance, um, we aren't doing it yet, uh, but it's an aspiration to do it, but uh, guys like Joel Salatin are sometimes called farm stacking. So on our bison ranches, we could chase the bison in the pastures with um, turkeys, chickens, so forth, so we'd have two crops. We could put bees on it, three crops, okay? So you start to look at that, and the old uh, assumptions of, well, I look what I have now, it doesn't equate, they can't afford it. I suspect there's gonna be entrepreneurs and uh, investors and distribution systems that are gonna solve for it. So I, I'm totally hopeful. I just think some of the headlines are, well, nobody's gonna be able to afford it. Guess what? People will afford it because they need it. And, and the affordability question is one of the most difficult and complicated ones. There's no simple answer. But as Sean said, there are, you know, he's pointing to some of the solutions. Uh, making better use of every single part of the animal and every single thing we pull out of the oceans, right? I mean, sort of the trash fish trend, the using off cuts trend, all of that adds to the system stuff that we were previously throwing away and, in fact, does make it much more affordable. Shopping and eating in season also makes things more affordable. So there's sort of like systematic changes that we have to do to ensure that healthy, nutritious foods are more accessible. But some of these other trends that are eliminating waste end up making more food available. So it, it's, there's, there's no easy solution, but, but a lot of things we're talking about ultimately give more access. There's also some big trends that don't get talked about. Like a lot of things are deflationary. Housing can become cheaper. To, to live better, uh, irrigation systems, all, all these things, that uh, transportation is becoming easier. We can move faster to more places. I think also in, in our country, we spend the least amount of our personal incomes on food than we ever have. Um, in fact, somebody else even told me, the human race spends the fewest amount of calories burnt to acquire their food of any living thing we've ever had on this earth. That may need to change. Maybe to spend more calories doing giving our food or money. Great. Time for one more question. Great. So this is a quick question for everybody um, because my power is in my dollar as a consumer. I work in the food industry, if you will, but it's sort of local and um, and so if everybody could just say like one takeaway. It doesn't necessarily have to say like 
read the grass-fed label or fair trade, maybe even more something, right? So like, I'd love to hear about that because when I go to the store, if I see fair trade, I'm like, oh, I like a darker roast. Um, like educate, I think everybody here is involved in food, so they're gonna be able to receive a no, more nuanced um, answer if you have one about how to help us help your mission. Lisa, do you want to go? So I, I, this is like my most feared dinner party conversation <laughs> because I think the more you learn about any system, sometimes the harder it is to really distill a quick answer. I would say definitely don't trust a label. Like certifications are not the answer for coffee, which is a really difficult thing to say because they've done a lot of work, especially in consumer awareness. One thing I think about is anything that you buy, think about where it comes from, and then think about the cost of getting it from there to you. Right? And so if that seems, wow, this is so cheap, probably somebody got screwed. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't, I want to stump for a brand because lots of people in coffee are doing really good work. But I think, think about where coffee comes from. Very steep hillsides, very far away. It's entirely picked by hand, except for Brazil. And it has to go through many processes before it ends up in your hands. If it is $7 a pound, somebody definitely got screwed. Right? And sometimes you'll get sold on a label that charges you just for being a fancy brand instead of doing good work. But I think it's worth the risk now to think about our bananas. I think about bananas all the time. Where bananas come from, that you can get them for like a quarter of the deli. It's nuts. Like, that's, it's pretty common sense. Anyway, that's my takeaway. Brian, what's your advice? Uh, I have a few quick things. Um, Make sure that you continue doing a little bit of cooking. Uh, in our busy lives, it's not always easy. I'm not cooking as much as I used to for a million reasons. That's a skill that's important to hold on to. It's also revolutionary at a time when cooking skills have been removed. Try to grow a little bit of your own food. I mean, I'm setting low bars here. If you want to do a lot, then do a lot. Um, and I think do not support any big brands at this point that are not making some sort of sustainability and transparency push. Campbell Soup, recent, Campbell's recently made the aggressive move of pulling out of the Grocery Manufacturers Association, the oldest agribusiness association in the country. This was not an easy move for them. They're still taking a lot of flack, but it makes me want to support them for some of their sustainability and traceability initiatives and not support their competition. So. It's hard to in entirely avoid these big brands in our pantry and in our shopping habits, and we have to support those ones that are doing everything they can to move in that direction. Mirage. Uh Well, thanks for stealing both my answers. <laughs> uh, but those are both excellent. You know, grow food, cook food, learn about where it comes from, just, just do a little bit of, and there's a information overload, certainly labels are really challenging, but just try to understand the provenance of the food, wh where it's coming from, who's growing it, um, and I think that'll give you a lot of comfort. I would say, for me, and, and how my journey as an entrepreneur, I approached it from a health and wellness aspect. Like I want to nourish my kids, I want to eat better, I want to live a, live a better life. So I think if people, if consumers, looked at the nutritional value per meal, as opposed to any price per pound. So, typically red meat, you're like, oh, what's the price per pound? So that's a trap. If you looked at what's the nutritional value, and then you also put another judge on it, like terroir, like, oh, I really like this tasting, uh, New Jersey grass-fed um, bison, then, then you like that. So if you look at that, the awareness of um, what your body will do better and what will ultimately reward a better ecosystem is a, is a good buy. Mine is still Everybody's still my answer. Um, mine might be a little bit more abstract, which is, you know, knowledge is power. We we don't have to distance ourselves from supply chains. We 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 have access to so much information, and I think that's really what the true power of technology is, that we have the means to understand where our food comes from. And so I would suggest to everybody, look at the global goal zero hunger. There are very specific targets that we want, that we as a collective species, like humans, that we want to achieve by 2030. Look at those targets. See if there's something that you feel like you can add to achieving those targets, whether it's what you purchase or what you do or how you eat or who you support. Um, I think we all, um, have a role to play in achieving these goals. 
great way to end it. Thank you all so much. That was fantastic.